the cloud. All right, this is, I'm Jerry Mikulski. This is Inside Jerry's Brain, the Santa edition, which is uh, bringing what would make your 2019 a fabulous year. I stupidly forgot I have a fabulous Santa hat and left it at home. Uh, so I'm, I apologize. I, on the walk here, I'm like, damn it, should have picked up the Santa hat. But there we are. And today is Friday, December 21st. I will go back to screen share in order to talk about Mighty Networks and Gina Bianchini's uh, sort of social network. And what were you saying, Robert, you want to jump back in and describe what you were saying a little bit? I have to unmute myself. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so it's neat. It's an online network that we started using for, uh, we're building several of them. One is for students and others who are interested in each charitable cause. Um, and then we have one for a deeper dive, which is students who are interested in the environment, student environmental organizations and others. And it's organized around members and groups, which can be private or open, and topics. So in our case, the groups are, in most of our cases, groups are universities or cities or companies. And the topics are, for instance, various ca charitable causes. Mm -hmm. And with, within groups, you can also have t group topics within those. So it's pretty well organized. It's easy to post stuff. Um, and to share and people get their dopamine hit when they get a little an email or another notification that someone commented or posted on their stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, there's some things that could be a whole lot better and we're bitching about, but that's my nature. That's um, and it's nice to go back and find things, unlike Facebook, where it's just this linear feed and then things disappear. Exactly. And then here's Ning. This remember, we many of us remember Ning. It got bought by yeah. Glam, amazingly enough, which is kind of strange but uh, I had it under online community platforms <clears throat> of which there have been many. Lithium is still around, I guess. Uh, most of these are gone, but a couple of them are still alive. And, and people trying to create an online community are still wrestling with what platform should I use? It's, a, it's still an open question, which is yeah. sort of sad. Yeah, one of the nice things about this is it's absurdly affordable. So they have a free plan, which is very limited. Um, the one we're on is $16 a month, paid monthly. Um, yep. And then have, and it has everything we need other than we don't need courses, which some people want, which they built in. Um, and we don't get the analytics. And if we later want courses and analytics, it's about $47 a month. But $16 a month and unlimited number of users and traffic, it's a great deal. It's a, it, that's $16 per month per community you start? Uh, per site, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, per site. Super interesting. Not, not, yeah, not per group within the site. That's total. But we have, we are <clears throat> changing the present with 50 charitable causes within it and hundreds of colleges. Super interesting. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, I, can I type a link into? You bet. This? There's, a, there's a chat here. If you can open up the chat yeah. on whatever, I don't, right, know what, I, yeah, I don't know what device yeah. you're using, but the chat yeah, is you, important during the call. So I was so confused by the um, brain thing. I forgot that I was the bigger container was uh, Zoom, which I've used. I'll paste this in. So if anyone wants to look. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the brain thing is a little confusing, sometimes overwhelming. Uh, and because we're in the Santa edition, I have gone to Santa Claus. <clears throat> and just for fun, uh, Santa Claus, the myth is based on this notion of Santa Claus which comes out of St. Nicholas. Uh, there's an opposing kind of holiday uh, tradition about Krampus, which is a scary character. They have uh, Krampus uh, Laufs. They have basically, in, in a lot of German towns in Bavaria, <clears throat> they have Krampus nights where these pretty nasty looking monsters walk around and scare the children. That's always fun, right? Uh, Santa Claus goes back to St. Nicholas which, who is a saint? I don't have very much on St. Nicholas. I should probably get a little bit more. But then the interesting part about Santa Claus, there's an interesting part of Santa Claus, just like there's an interesting background to the game Monopoly. Uh, so Coca-Cola actually uh, is responsible for the modern Santa Claus. And the red of his outfit is Coca-Cola red. <clears throat> um, so Coca-Cola basically uh, figured out to make, uh, what was it, uh, Sunblum? Sorry, my brain is a little, there we go. <clears throat> so they commissioned a fellow named Sonny Sunblum <clears throat> to uh, start drawing a modern Santa Claus because the old St. Nicholas, the old Sinterklaas was a skinny guy 
uh, not a jolly roly poly ho 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 guy. And so Sunblom is the one who creates the modern, uh, the modern Santa Claus. And if you go to the gift store at the Coke company store in Atlanta, you can buy little statuettes of Santa Claus holding bottles of Coke out, uh, which they were selling back in the 1930s. Uh, so I've got that under the marketing of our holidays about Valentine's Day, Singles Day in China, which is the, the largest e-commerce day of the year every year now because it's so successful as a meme. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's stuff I have around Santa. And then um, Santa is under Christmas, clearly. Uh, he's also an uncopyrighted character, so you can mess with Santa Claus, <clears throat> which is interesting, unlike Mickey Mouse, for example. Uh, so I've got Christmas under the holiday season, under Christianity. Uh, and uh, year-end holidays, I think, should also include Hanukkah, here we go, Festivus, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and Bodhi Day all together. Festivus, of course, is, uh, comes out of Seinfeld and includes the airing of grievances and feats of strength. So, uh, and the pole, there's a, there's a Festivus pole that basically you do something with, I don't know, but I, I was never much a fan of Seinfeld. But, but uh, I think our year-end holidays, how we sort of, and our springtime holidays are, are really fascinating because they, they go back a long ways to figure out how do we celebrate what it is we're doing. So I'll, I'll stop, uh, stop this long tangent for a moment, but uh, um, what does everybody want for, uh, from Santa this year? <clears throat> Jump on in. Anybody, Susan, do you have a wish list? What, what, what would make your 2019 truly fantastic? Um, rain. Rain, yes. Lots of, lots of rain. Uh, lots of rain for everybody. Yep. Everywhere. That's the top of the list. Pretty much everything else I want flows from that. So I'm in the Pacific Northwest. We do not perceive a lack of rain. We, there was a bit of a drought in Oregon, sort of, but this is the wet part of the country. <clears throat> uh, so oh, no, I was born there. Ah, where, Seattle or Portland or where? Portland. I didn't know that. Right. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, so we don't really perceive this, this lack of rain so much, but we absolutely, like last, the last year, one of the things that characterized 2018 was that the United States was simmering in the heat of summer. Uh, there were fires everywhere. Uh, a lot of the world was suffering climate-wise, and we felt a little bit sort of protected from it here, but... Um, I think this is a general, general purpose good wish to get some rainfall and some, some, some protection elsewhere. And it's, um, yes, here, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, whether, I don't know if anybody noticed, but we were protected from all that heat. There was a, I can't remember the particular configuration of the ocean and the uh, jet stream or whatever it was, but something kept the San Francisco Bay Area quite cool. We did mm -hmm. not, I mean, you know, 25 miles from here, it was hot. If you went west. Exactly. So interesting. Um, this is a, let me just, while we're at it, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, so I had a call a while ago, uh, which was really interesting. There we go. So I had a call back in 2011, a Yitan call, when I was doing the podcast before podcasts were actually cool. And uh, the, the fellow who joined us was Bill Liao of WeForest. And he said something that I found super interesting uh, that was contrary to my conventional wisdom, because I always think that you know, trees grow where there's enough rain for trees to grow. He was actually saying that trees can create rain that if you plant trees and you keep moving the margin of where the trees can grow, the trees exhale vapor and bacteria, then that, that actually precipitates rain. So you can move the rain line by planting trees. And uh, another, another thought that probably is not a great, you know, aha to anybody, is that most desertification is man-made. That we've plowed 
you know, when you plow, uh, you screw up the earth, a whole bunch of, of, of interesting things. These are all connected to a nexus that I created, I think early this year. Early this year, I realized I had a whole series of insights about soil and raising food and agriculture and all of that. Uh, so I connected them all to this one thought. So for example, uh, the rules of, of soil fertility, like disturb your soil as little as possible, is one of the principles of soil fertility. Uh, plowing destroys soil fertility, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so um, maybe we should all go plant a couple trees to get more rain showing up in the Bay Area or something. I mean, what, what's interesting is I bet we could be strategic about it and look at weather patterns and look at what areas are, are drier and what, you know, what's going on and send people off into those areas to do some tree planting. And that might actually be a fun and useful thing. But, but if we could collectively steer that kind of activity, um, it might be really cool. Yes, and there's that wonderful book um, written by a German. Somebody else help me out. Um, on trees. On trees? Uh, and trees, how they, they talk to each other. Oh, they communicate. Of they, all of that stuff. The Wood Wide know? Web. Let me go there. It's, yeah. Uh, I know what you mean. It's a fabulous book. So <clears throat> I've got a bunch of stuff on the Wood Wide Web because there's also a woman, Susan uh, something, whose name was going to come up in a moment because she's connected to the Wood Wide Web. Uh, running Zoom and my brain and Chrome at the same time, yeah. not, not always easy on my machine. There we go. So <clears throat> here's the secrets of the Wood Wide Web. Uh, Susan, Suzanne Simard is her name. There, there we go. And then uh, the book you're thinking about is The Hidden Life of Trees. Yes. Which was written by doot, 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 uh, Peter, Peter Vorleben. And he says that trees are social, trees will help an ancient stump stay alive. The thing that, the thing that got me really interested here was when I realized the role that mycelia play next to trees, right? So, so apparently, and I'm, I'm gonna brutally oversimplify the biology here because I am not a biologist, but trees can't metabolize minerals out of soil very easily. They're really good at photosynthesis, and that means they can, they can sort of break down uh, H2O and, and CO2 and a lot of those things and turn them into carbon parts for the tree and so forth. But they're not really good at leaching minerals out of the soil. Guess who is really good at getting minerals out of soil? Mushrooms, mycelium. Yeah. And so what happens is underground, there's a rhizomal network where the mushrooms are trading sugars for minerals yeah. with the trees. And there's chemical communication happening down at this, at this layer, but I never realized that without bacteria and fungi, mm -hmm. trees couldn't get the nutrition they need. Like they, they, they wouldn't be able to grow and develop the way they are because they wouldn't get, you know, they, they would have less than their US RDA <clears throat> of stuff that they need to actually grow up big and strong. Um, and so, so that, that's, that's the opening of the communication channel through which there's chemical signaling about hey, over at this end of the forest, there's a, a bug invader or a chemical invader or a fungal invader even, you know, and, and maybe build some resistance. Or, or um, also what happens is when a tree is dying, it will send a lot of its surplus energy out into its root system to feed other trees. Oh. So all of that sort of stuff is happening. So here's older trees send nourishment to their offspring. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch that people are, are busy researching and discovering in the, in the wood wide web, which I happen to have been curious about at some point, so I put it in my brain. How about that? And what I can do also is I'll put, um, I'll put links in our chat uh, that bookmark. What the brain does not let me do today is uh, send you a breadcrumb trail of the things I've been looking at. I can't, I can't send you every thought I'm clicking on, but I can occasionally punctuate our chat with the link that I'm on right now. So I just sent you a link to not so much the Wood Wide Web, but the book, The Hidden Life of Trees, which is connected to the Wood Wide Web. So you can get there on your own if you'd like to. And John Liu is fabulous. Uh, Michael, thank you. So um, let me just go back and find John Liu. 
because he's a part of another thing that I care a lot about. Let me find John. There we go, John D. Liu. And by the way, I'm, I'm sitting here. It's just me and uh, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> um, so here's John Liu, and here's Green Gold, which is the documentary I think you just pointed to. Um, he is a documentary filmmaker who went out to the Lowe's Plateau, and basically, this is the, uh, I'm going to tell a little story here because I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, and in, in fact, it's completely related to what we were just talking about, about trees create water, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely related. So the, the Los Plateau is an area the size of Belgium uh, in the middle of China. In fact, I need to uh, connect the Los Plateau to China. That's very weird that I don't have it there. Um, I would normally probably connect it to the province of China where it belongs, but you know, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, there we go, PRC. So I just made, I just made that connection. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen my brain before, each node is called a thought because it's called the brain. I can connect thoughts to each other through these three little circles called gates. And notice that there's three sides, but there's no gate on the right-hand side and you're, you're like, you might scratch your head and go, why, why isn't there one? And then after you use it for a while and you realize <clears throat> kind of how, how this works, it makes a lot of sense why, why it's arranged this way. So, um, Liu goes to the Lowe's Plateau and he watches, he goes over a course of 10 years and he watches as the Chinese government employs the local villagers who are living in a barren wasteland. It is all dust blowing off. Lowe's is very loose, friable earth. And when you remove all of its cover, when you remove the plants, it just blows off. So they had enormous dust storms in Beijing and other places downwind of the Lowe's Plateau because all of the thousand years of accumulated soil were basically blowing off. So they employ the villagers to sit down and start terracing and planting trees and trapping water high up in the hills. And over 10 years, he goes back and he, he films the same exact places. And they're green now. They're, they're verdant. They're doing really, really well. And there's a woman he interviews and she says, you know, um, 10 years ago, I was making like 600 yuan a year and struggling like crazy. And now I'm selling apples and I'm making 6,000 yuan a year and things are better. And, and in the meantime, at the beginning, when he gets there 10 years earlier, everybody's emigrating. Everybody is leaving the area. And I don't know if people went back or whatever, but it's super interesting kind of how this whole thing plays out uh, in the Lowe's Plateau. And this whole, um, this whole notion of, of healing the earth is connected for me to a notion I, uh, that is, is sort of called upward spiral. Uh, Wait, which, before you go there, yeah. note, note the difference between the strategy that we took uh, after the um, um, Dust Bowl, which was that uh, we tried to stop the proximal cause, which was the wind. Right. We also tried to teach farmers to farm a little differently. That's true. We did. We we that, realized was, that was about wind. That was about wind control. Exactly. But the shelter belts, I grew up with shelter belts. Yeah. And uh, the best part was the hedge apples. <laughs> <laughs> and hedgerows play a really important role. You're totally right. So here's soil conservation. Here's Hugh Hammond benefit, uh, Bennett rather, and Operation Dust Bowl. I think I need to learn a little more about that. So you were saying, uh, what were they called? Wind, wind belts? No. Uh, no, um, shelter belts. Shelter belts. I'm going to just Google that and then put it in later. Right, because they were they were made up of three kinds of trees. Yep. Uh, there was a lower uh, clear story. I mean, a lower lower set of bushes. Then there was something that grew really fast, and then behind it was things that grew sl more slowly. Yes. Super interesting. And I don't have wind breaks. Seriously. Okay, I've got some patching up to do in my brain here while we switch to a different topic. Let me see. So let me go to windbreaks and then I'll find shelter belts and then we will- And hedge see. apples. Yeah. Uh, hedge apples uh, function the way um, buckeyes and conquerors do. We threw them at each other. Oh, cool. There we go. So I'm going to put windbreaks in. I'm gonna drag, so I drag 
the URL into my brain, I let go, and then I wait a moment, and I'm gonna to have to wait like three times as long because we have Zoom going. But what I've just done is added this, it, it picks up the name of the page and the URL, and I actually wanna put windbreaks opposite wind because they're a way of slowing down the wind. And then under windbreaks, I'll see if um, a windbreak, also known as a shelter belt. So I'm just going to go here and call it, and I usually pluralize everything. There we go. And uh, I can, I, and I don't know whether to, to connect this to Operation Dust Bowl or not because I need to figure that out. So hold on a second. Let's see if that gives me anything. Dust Bowl, Operation Eagle Claw. Nope, I don't get Operation Dust Bowl. Interesting. So I, have to, I don't know why I put that in my brain. I have to figure out if it means anything. Hugh Hammond Bennett, there we go. Hardest hit code name, Operation Dust Bowl. So here's Hugh Hammond Bennett. Oh, Susan, what are you holding up? A hedge post. That's a hedge post? Well, the remains of a hedge post. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Hedge is very strong. Yeah. That's lovely. Hold on, let me stop sharing and take a closer look. That's beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. I just happen to have one. Um, and then Michael is pointing out how uh, mushrooms can save the world. That is very likely uh, Paul uh, Stamets' video, is that right? Yep, and sorry, just because this is a little bit like Stump the Band or whatever in the old Johnny Carson thing. Um, Paul Stamets is super interesting here as well. Mycelia are Miracle plants. So mushrooms are the fruiting body of the mycelium plant. Um, and here's Paul Stamets, here's Funga Fantastical, Fungal Fantastical, the Spirit of Good. Here's Six Ways Mushrooms Can Save the World, which is his TED Talk, I think. Yep, it's a TED Talk from, uh, from back when. It's one of, it was, I put it under my favorite video clips and then later learned that plants talk to each other using an internet of fungus, which, is, which we were just talking about. Uh, but bioremediation, there's a whole bunch of super interesting things that Stamets has been exploring. My only real problem with Stamets is that he is gung-ho about protecting all of his IP and making lots of money from it, which means that he doesn't share his ideas broadly and openly, which um, makes me a little bit crazy, but that's okay. And my brain is now deciding not to cooperate as much. I don't know why. So let me stop sharing and see what else anybody wants for Christmas. Uh, Lauren, welcome to the call. We don't know each other, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, do you have any, any wishes for Santa or do you want to say hi and introduce yourself a little bit? Oh, hi. I'm so happy to be here. I've heard about you from uh, Charles, Charles Glass, I think. Oh, cool. Yeah, he showed me the brain. So, I with it. so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so my name is Lauren Nignon and I am from Milan and I live here kind of as a, a French expat because my husband is French and um, uh, for Christmas I am looking for a co-conspirator. In what? Uh, for Save the World plan. Okay, um, that could be a lot of things. Eric is holding up his hand. I mean, we got, we got volunteers. Can you, do you want to describe <laughs> it? Uh, my, so my basic, my basic premise is, um, it, this is my favorite idea ever. To have kind of like a, oh, excuse me. You have small units that are making a little bit of noise, but that's okay. We can still hear, <laughs> we can still hear you clearly, so we're good. Okay, great. So my idea that I want to explore is to kind of create a, um, our own 9-11, like some kind of history changing day where we introduce this like amazing technology 
that's never been seen and there's like a shift in consciousness that there's some new era that's dawned um, that doesn't stem from fear but some kind of excitement that there's people in the world who are organized enough to actually do this. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know, we don't even have this technology, but I just love to think about it and how you would plan it. <laughs> so that's what I'm interested in for Christmas. Hmm. It's a little bit like uh, Arrival, the movie. Did you see the movie with Jodie Foster? Uh, yes, wait, maybe. Does, does that movie, like, like there's this big spacecraft that, that, that sort of descends to earth just barely above, you know, above the ground. And she's the mm -hmm. one who cracks the code about their spiral uh, language that looks like ink blots. Remember yes. that one? Uh -huh. I think that was not Judy Foster, it was Amy Adams. Judy Foster was contact. Thank you. You're yes, right. Yes, it, it was Amy Adams. Yeah. Amy Adams, exactly. Thank you. Sorry. In my brain, it's set up correctly. I, I should have I referred to that one instead of this one. Um, but you're totally right. So did, did, did Arrival kind of like mesh with this vision you have, Lauren? No, it's more like um, if you had like the most famous directors in the world and it were like a world movie. Um, like, um, like hundreds of Game of Thrones quality theatricals of like, just like amazing dramas. Uh, I don't know, you could have, like you could have a, a but each locality could take that theme and make it their own. Like it could be like a world truce where air, like warring factions get together and have a performance or a party or whatever. So maybe it's a, dis but it's the, uh, a distributed participative performance piece that any community could pick up and do, but we all do it simultaneously. Yes using kind of distributed versioning in media. So there would be like, uh, so you could actually make footage um, of all of these events and anyone could take footage and together in any way that they wanted to kind of make their own movie from it. So it's not, it's not it wouldn't just be like one movie, like mm -hmm. the way that they make it now. There's just one version of the movie, you have thousands. Agreed. And anybody want to jump in? I mean, does this, uh, does this idea resonate for, for others on the call? Or do you have suggestions for how to go about it? Go ahead, Eric. It, uh, it, it reminds me a bit, although on a different scale, of the uh, there's just, a, just next week is a new Peter Jackson documentary coming out about World War I, where the Imperial Museum in London gave archival footage to different filmmakers and basically were told, do something creative, don't destroy the, the originals, and, and go. Uh, and Jackson's is coming in, and he, what he happened to do was take that archival footage, um, clean it up digitally, colorize it, make it 3D, um, hired uh, forensic lip readers to figure out what the people were saying in the silent footage, hire actors with the right dialects to speak it, and I'll know more once I see it next week, but it's only it's playing around the U.S. on December 27th. It's the only day you can see it. Um, but I'm thinking that kind of thing, if there was certain footage you could put out to lots of people and say, you know, some, a basic charge of make this into something meaningful for your community in a way to improve it, improve its environment, go. And then, because um, the other piece that comes into me, just again, uh, thinking of the, an analogy, is the good folks at Moet and Hennessy, and Champagne always makes the world better. Um, but they did a sort of globally sourced, make a 60 minute film about how champagne makes you happy. And they got tens of thousands of submissions, which they then curated into a little uh, film festival and posted and obviously that's very commercially driven, but the idea of put a seed out there, put some very basic parameters around it and then say, go. You just need a way when it all comes back to, I think, curate it and distribute it. Uh, here's They Shall Not Grow Old in My Brain. This is the documentary he did using archive footage, I think from the Imperial War Museum. So let me actually, because uh, I'm pretty sure I have the Imperial War Museum in my brain. <clears throat> so um, 
they basically gave him access to their archives. He hunted down other things, but he decided up front in bulk to just improve all the foot, digitize and upgrade all the footage. He was like, we're not gonna pick and choose. We're gonna take all of this and figure out how to, so what they did was a lot of this footage was shot with people with hand cranked cameras and your hand speed varies. So that's why the walking is herky jerky and it's not all, you know, it doesn't play back always nicely. So they inferred proper timing. So they had to reset all these pieces. They had to tween the, the, the frames in order to infer broken and jagged areas. They cleaned them up and then they colorized all these things, including visiting the sites to get the right greens for the forest, consulting with uh, uniform experts to figure out what color should the buttons be, what, are the, you know, what color are the metals and the, the stripes. Uh, they, they really went deep. Then they used lip readers to figure out what some of the people in the scenes were saying and what orders somebody in the background might be shouting at these people you know, there. And then they dubbed those in in the right accents. So if you were looking at the Lancashire footage of the Lancashire regiment, they found somebody to dub in the, the, the words in a Lancashire accent. So they got, they really worked hard and then they donated all of the upgraded footage now back to the museum. Right. Then they sat down and picked from that and made They Shall Not Grow Old. So it's insane. Like the, the amount of work and the, the quality of craft and care that went into this is extraordinary. It's a tremendous, it's war footage. Um, but all of a sudden these people, these characters from 1914 to 1918 <clears throat> go from being stick figures that are walking around like this that don't quite seem human and real and whatever to jumping out at you as if we were shooting the, the footage today as if it was the Vietnam War or, or something else like that. Um, you know, so much about war. And I happen to be a, a bit of an amateur historian about these kinds of things. Actually, let me just connect articles about World War I to articles about World War II just for fun. Uh, but this is a whole bunch, of, um, whole bunch of things that I've tracked over time about all these different things. Here's World War II. Between the ages of 11 and 16, I was obsessed with World War II. I built little model airplanes. I read books. I did whatever else. So. Um, so there we are. But um, there's plenty there. And, and there's also, um, are you familiar with um, the, I, I always forget his name, Eric, uh, the guy who did the virtual choir. Eric Whitaker's virtual choir. L Lauren, have you seen this? So this yeah, is where that, he had a TED talk, right? Exactly. This 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 TED talk. They all, right, yes. This TED yes, talk right here, in fact. Yeah, it's definitely a long idea of you basically take an idea and it's um, it has to be something that you don't have to coordinate it in a pyramid structure. So right. I'm actually like trying to create um, uh, a horizontal uh, information structure through this idea of a day, like a deadline day that we have to like get yeah. our shit together by this day. But that, um, so each locality has their own thing. Um, so they're all organizing separately but how do you shape the um, kind of like mapping structures and um, the stuff that you need in common? Yeah. How do you how do you coordinate without having any kind of central point of failure, basically? Right. So people have been working on uh, these issues, but it's kind of like blockchain tech based, and I'm trying to figure out how you do that just in a human algorithm. So a couple things. Um, I just showed you Tiffany Schlein, who runs the Moxie Institute. She's the daughter of Leonard Schlein, who was a really interesting guy. But she's been crowdsourcing movies, which are not exactly what you're looking for. But she gets thousands of contributors to record a script and send it in. And then she clips that together from a whole bunch of different sources, saying something, making a statement for whatever the day is. So uh, cloud filmmaking is kind of what she calls it. Moxie Institute is where she's looking. 
Then separately, there was a, I want to know, I don't, I want to try to remember what it was called. That's um, video editing. There was an open source piece of software that went away. It died. And it really pissed me off that it died. It might have, was it Kaltura? And it really pissed me off because this, this video editing had um, open source project media players might have been this one. I'm not sure. I have to kind of look around a little bit more, but it had the feature where all of the media elements were basically sourceable from anywhere. So as you were assembling your video that you were going to share, this clip could be from YouTube over here. This could be music from over here. This could be an image from over here. It was a movie was sort of like assembling a web page. And you could offer up all the parts for editing for anybody. So somebody could remix your movie and make it differently. Um, another, uh, another movement that's a little bit like this is hit record or hit record, which is uh, Joe Gordon uh, Levitt's thing. I don't know if they're still around or still doing things, but this was super interesting where they were crowdsourcing movies. Uh, I went to look at hit, hit record and the problem was that most of their movies were kind of trivial. But I was really interested, can I, could I offer a script or a skeleton of a movie into hit record, um, or hit record, I guess it's called, uh, that other people could then much, make much better because other people would be you know, uh, more capable of editing. So here, by the way, is uh, Joe Gordon-Levitt and his brother, uh, Burning Dan Gordon-Levitt. Here's his uh, Twitter address, and then here's some of the movies he's been in. So he was in Inception, Lincoln, Looper, Snowden, The Walk, uh, Inception also has, uh, of course, Leo DiCaprio, Michael Caine. Michael Caine uh, was in a whole bunch of movies, including The Caine Mutiny, The Italian Job, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which is pretty damn funny. Con movie, so it's a con game movie that is like The Sting, Trouble in Paradise, Nine Queens. If you haven't seen Nine Queens, don't see the American remake. See the original Argentine version with, with subtitles. Nine Queens is fabulous because Ricardo Darín is a fantastic actor. Watch anything this guy is in. With that, I end this non-sponsored uh, digression. Um, but definitely watch Nueve Reinas. It's, it's really phenomenal. It's, a, it's a, the, the perfect con game movie. Um, anybody else have uh, Christmas wishes? Well, not a Christmas list, but a comment on that idea of a collaborative, um, creative effort and film where you took it. So just as a quick side note, there's a film in 1932 called If I Had a Million. And the premise is a dying tycoon has a bunch of ingrate kids. So instead of giving his money to them, he gives a million dollars to each of eight randomly chosen people. And a different director directed each of those eight pieces. So W.C. Fields is one of the, the stars of one of the eight. Cool. I am now looking it up. I'll, I'll go back to screen sharing in a second. <clears throat> I'm going to add it to my brain while we're talking, just because that's what Inside Jerry's Brain is supposed to do. Uh, if I had a million, 1932. There you go. So I don't, it turns out I just looked it up. I do not have it in my brain. So let's see. Uh, Aaron Lubitsch, I'm pretty, there were seven directors. What? How does this, how does this yeah, work so again? So, so the basic premise, what you start with is the, the dying tycoon, and then he picks a name from a phone book like this, and then that, the next segment of the film is produced by one of those, created by one of those directors who shows the scenario of who that person is and what they do with the million dollars. Cool. And it comes to its conclusion, and then it goes back to the main setting, and he picks another name from the phone book and goes off to the next director's segment. That is totally so brilliant. That is brilliant. So I just noticed that um, Gary Cooper was, it stars Gary Cooper, it says down here, and I knew I have Gary Cooper in my brain. So it's a 1932 film. <clears throat> uh, it's just a, is a drama, is that the plot? Yeah. Cool, so I will, I'll add it to dramas, which has a lot of movies in it. As you can see, these are all siblings. And then uh, Lubitsch, I think I have in my brain, let's find out. Yep, there's Ernst Lubitsch. So I just made a connection to the director, Ernst Lubitsch, who is one of the seven directors. He also directed Trouble in Paradise, 
which I think is a movie we were just looking at, right? Con game movies, how about that? Very funny how small and circular the world is, isn't it? Um, so Ernst already had, I, I won't go through all seven, but I'm very tempted to because I love doing things like this. Let's see if we have Norm Tarog. I don't have Tarog, so just for, I'll do one more just for fun. Uh, and I think I have Charles Lawton, let's find out. Yeah, pretty sure I have Charles Lawton. Um, he's a pretty famous actor from back in the day. Uh, I don't have any other movies of his, but he was married to Elsa Lanchester who wrote Charles Lawton and I, because I think he went crazy or something like that. There's, I don't remember what the story was. Um, but let me add uh, Norman Torog just for, just for grins. Uh, wait until my browser goes to Norman Torog. I will just drag his icon into my brain. Wait a second. I'm pulling him under if I had a million because that's how it works. And then I'm just gonna drag him over here because I always put directors to the left of their movies. And then I'm gonna connect him up to the thought directors. Bing, bing. So everything is moving a little slower, like half time for me. I mean, 2x for me. Uh, usually when I do this, it's pretty quick. Um, he was also a screenwriter. He wrote second youngest person to ever win the award, blah, blah, blah. Oh, he, he, he did Boys Town, which I'm pretty sure I have. So let's connect him just for now to Boys Town. Nope, don't have Boys Town. That is crazy that I don't have Boys Town. Okay, sorry, need to fix that. Um, Anybody else want to put a different birthday wish? Uh, sorry, uh, Santa, Santa's list wish into our conversation while I'm adding Boys Town? Because I'm embarrassed Jerry, I don't have Boys Town in here. Jerry, I just want to say, if you're going to have Charles Lawton, you have to put Witness for the Prosecution, which is perhaps his, his best movie. Fabulous. 1938 film. 38. This is a biographical drama. So this is biopics. So I have a whole bunch of, so this is all biopics. <clears throat> a Beautiful Mind, A Private War, A Quiet Passion, Agora, Alive, All That Jazz, All the Money in the World, American Maid, American Sniper, Black Klansman, Barfly Awakenings. Uh, so Black Klansman is a movie by Spike Lee, just came out this year about a guy who goes and engages Klan people, but he's black, really interesting. Oh so, yeah, that is an Pardon? Yeah, it's an interesting story. Yeah, and so here's Spencer Tracy, who I know I have in my brain, so I'm gonna add Spencer for Boys Town. Uh, Mickey Rooney, of course I have Mickey Rooney, so let's make that connection. And I'm going to connect it to Father Edward Flanagan, because this is a biopic and this is who it's based on. So I'm gonna wait until we get Edward Flanagan, and he was a priest and he had an orphanage. So here's Edward Flanagan. I put, if the movie is derived from somebody's life, I put it above, I put the person above. Um, I have, of course, a thought priests. And then of course I have a thought, uh, this is not pretty, but I've been tracking the Catholic abuse scandals and tracking articles about them and everything else. And, um, so there's a whole bunch of material here, which I won't get into, uh, but he ran an orphanage known as Boys Town, which I will now put in my brain above Father Flanagan. And I think I have orphanages, which is sad, but let's find out. Orphanages, there we go. And I have it, but I noticed that I don't have it linked to um, I don't have it linked to the Wikipedia definition for orphanages, so I'm going to do that. <clears throat> there we go. Grab it, and then I'm gonna put it on top of the thought orphanage so that it adds itself to an already existing title. So now this W just showed up because I just added the page for orphanages to my brain. Now, um, witness the prosecution, was it, for Charles Lawton? Witness for the prosecution, and I just saw recently Advise and Consent with Henry Fonda, which was mm. really amazing to watch because it's so timely to see 
people in government who care, which brings me to my Christmas wish, which is I'd like some adults in the White House. The last one just left. Yeah, that's why I want more. <laughs> the last one just left. It's bad. Things are bad. It's very bad. It's very bad. Witness for the Prosecution is here. Uh, Lawton was in a lot of movies, so I'm embarrassed that I don't have him connected to those. But right now we're going to fix Witness for the Prosecution by dragging it in. It's a courtroom drama with film noir elements. Billy Wilder. Damn. Yeah. It's like right, fantastic gotta, gotta movie. You you guys, you'll it. love it. It's fantastic. Uh, so I've got... Marlena Dietrich's in it. Um, Tyrone Power. Here's Billy Wilder. And Billy Wilder, I already have for Sunset Boulevard, The Apartment, Double Indemnity, Death Mills, The Todesmühlen, The Best Years of Our Lives, and Let's Go Back to Witness for the Prosecution. And this is a, I don't know if I have courtroom. I don't have courtroom dramas, I just have dramas. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect it to dramas. Gotta spell it right. And then who else was in it? Uh, Marlena? Marlena Dietrich and um, Tyrone Power. And Elsa Lancaster. Yes. And Elsa is Charles's wife, right? Yes. They were each other's beards. Mm, that's right. I think the, the best thing I ever saw Charles Lawton do was um, a description of how a fan had accosted him with, I love all your films, Mr. Lawton. And he said, which ones? And she, she said, well, really liked Witness for the Prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he led her down a, a, a cascade of, did you like the scene where he was peering through the keyhole? Yeah. <laughs> brilliant stuff. You won't find that, I'm afraid. It was a live broadcast about 40 years ago. Man. So I don't have Tyrone <laughs> Power in my brain. That's terrible. I'm you do, that. sir. It's all in there. Everything <laughs> I need to fix Tyrone Power not being there. There we go. And then I need to add beard because I thought I had it, but I don't. Let's see if, um, let's see if Wikipedia knows anything about the cultural use of the word beard as a protection mechanism. Here we go, beard disambiguation, let's go there. <clears throat> Places people companion, usually opposite sex companion used to conceal infidelity or to hide the fact that one is gay. So I'm going to go to beards. I'm going to go add beard companion under that, because it's basically metaphoric. And then I'm going to connect that to Charles Lawton. And also uh, his wife, same thing. It was like mutual. Yes, as far as I know. Awesome. And there's plenty more of, course, of these. Elsa but I'm... Lancaster was the bride of Frankenstein, for those who are not familiar. Oh, right. I think, do I know that? I'm going to find out if I know that now. Look. <clears throat> so I apparently knew that. All right, here, uh, history, I uh, see also, but here, uh, here we go. Uh, Rock Hudson, for example. Phyllis Gates acted as a beard to avert damage there. So, da -da, so I'm going to add Phyllis Gates to beards and then connect her to Rock Hudson. Where Hudson wasn't the beard, but she was his beard, right? This must be uh, three degrees of freedom or something, is it? Uh, this winds up feeling a little bit like, uh, like that after a while. It's very true. So here's Rock Hudson, AIDS victims. He was in the star system. I, I don't have, even have any of his movies there, but uh, yeah. All right, so advice and consent. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I missed something at the very end. Hey, Gene, welcome to the call. Glad you're here. Do we have any more Christmas wishes? Uh, Robert, we can't hear you. You are muted. Yep. Now. now. Yeah, I, yes, Good. we can hear you now. Perfect. Okay. And this actually has a Christmas theme. Jerry, you know about what I'm working on. I don't think, I don't know that any of the others do, and I'll mention um, 
and if this is of interest, I could, I'd love to talk further with people about it later. So on the Santa theme, um, the problem that we have a nonprofit, it's called changingthepresent.org. The New York Times called it an Amazon.com of the nonprofit world. And our goal is to channel to nonprofits, all of which desperately need more money, some of the $450 billion that Americans spend each year buying birthday, wedding, and holiday presents. And some, some of those presents are wonderful, and a lot of it is a waste of money. When my grandfather turned 90, he didn't really need any more sweaters, but I needed to show my love, so that's what I did. There's the beginning of a trend of people showing their love by making a meaningful donation in their friend's name instead of buying them more stuff. And the nonprofit that pioneered this and really proved the opportunity is one called Heifer International. You probably know the catalog of farm animals. A friend said, I didn't just give $20 to Heifer. I bought my wife a flock of ducks for a family in India. They make it feel like a gift. It's tangible. There's a story. There's a picture. There's a greeting card. More nonprofit. By the way, they raise $110 million a year for farm animals for the developing world. And we saw that and thought, gee, more nonprofits should make the experience feel like a gift. And they could capture some of that $450 billion for hunger and cancer and the environment and all sorts of other causes. And it's just too difficult for them to make it feel like a gift, right? It needs to be tangible. You need greeting cards, ideally personalized ones, wish lists, registries, um, gift cards, on and on and on. And we've only found 12 nonprofits with anything resembling a gift-like experience, two with wish lists, three with gift cards, and zero with personalized printed greeting cards. Mm -hmm. So we set out to do all that. And we see our role is threefold. One is to... Um, facilitate this type of fundraising for nonprofits. The second is to enable that type of alternative gift giving for people who want meaning, want to give or receive meaning instead of stuff. And third is use the platform, use a website as a platform to promote the social norm. You don't need to go shopping to show your love. Instead, one thing you can do is make a difference in the world and we'll package that experience to feel like a memorable gift that you can share with your friends. We're not naive. We're not going to put a dent in Macy's in the mall, but the smallest sliver of $450 billion now spent on presents would be a lot of new money for nonprofits. So we're at an early, we have great board of advisors, people like the head or former head of UNICEF, Sierra Club, Sesame Street, Ashoka, Amnesty International, people like Esther Dyson. Um, and her. we've got 400 nonprofits on the site. We've got some really nice press. We're still at a very early stage. Um, we have a lot to do and relationships we're trying to build and introductions we want and celebrities we want to connect to and funders that we need to connect to and on and on. So if anyone's interested in what we're doing, I'd love to, I'd love general comments now, but then I'd love to connect <laughs> offline and deeper dive later. And is there yeah, something, anyway. is there something specific that, that you could ask? Like, like a particular thing that would be super helpful that's specific? Um, one thing that'd be super helpful that's specific is if you could make an introduction to Peter Buffett. Oh, I think okay. Would, and then I know that you met with him a year or two ago. I, um, probably five years ago. And he doesn't, he hasn't been very um, good about replying to me since then, but I'm happy to try. Okay. But the, the big needs are, um, and I can, I'm going to put a page on the site, which I'll share with anyone who's interested about the different types of things we're looking for, because this covers lots of different causes. So we want ways to reach people, which is everything from media to social media to strategic partnerships, et cetera. Um, connections to celebrities, because they get a lot of attention and people follow them. Connections to funding sources. Um, so there's, it's not just a short list of a couple of things. And everyone has, everyone on this call may have a totally different um, area where they might be able to help. Mm -hmm. Super, thank you. Um, Ken, thank you for adding Siva to the chat because I didn't have enough on them and I didn't have them connected right. So Robert, while you were talking, I was, I was curating a little bit <clears throat> and that yeah. led me to blindness and that read, led me to willful blindness or willful ignorance, which is um, under emotion and membership trumps reason most of the time, which is one of my major logics for why people are sticking to Trump. And uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting things going on there. So here's, yeah, uh, for I, example, go ahead. Yeah, and, and SIVA is great. And they're one of the 400 nonprofits that we started with. Uh, so here we go. The, the chat thing go here we go cool all right 
Restore a blind person's eyesight for fifty dollars. Give it as a gift. You and your friend much warmer than a sweater. <laughs> I love it. Um, Eric, anything that would make twenty nineteen like fantastic? Is there? A, uh, you're muted right now, but uh, do you have a Santa's list? Um, I do, and it it uh, I think relates directly to what what the experience of this call has been. Um, one of the little uh, watchwords I've been carrying around with myself since this has been a, a year of great output, just finishing a book and doing a lot of teaching and speaking, is that quality output requires three to five times quality input. Um, and so I would love, I need to find a way or catch up with the technologies that allow for efficient curation of that input and intelligent processing of it. Uh, I mean, you've been doing it in real time here in your brain to a certain extent. Um, and there is just, you, you open the spigot and there's so much good stuff to bring in. And I, I'm, if I could solve that problem for me, I would love it. Um, what do you thoughts you guys have of working with, I believe, if Feedly's still around or whatever kinds of things you're using beyond the brain, let me know. Yeah, um, some people are using um, Pinboard, which is sort of the inheritor of Delicious, right? Because okay. Delicious was a really, really nice bookmark sharing community. It died. Yahoo bought it with a black thumb, killed it. Um, and then you would think Delicious is a really simple thing to host, run, or, and that Josh Schachter, who found that it would go back in and no, nothing, so dead. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of gone over to Pinboard, which I, I, some friends of mine are fans of Pinboard. I'm of course fan of this brain thing, uh, which you're, you know, I think you know you can browse it for free, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I do. <laughs> awesome. Thank and, you. And send me stuff and say, hey, I noticed you don't have very much about X, and I will write you back either saying, thank you, I've added it, or hey, you missed it, it's over here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> which, great. Which, happen, which happens now and then as well, it's kind of fun. <laughs> okay, Devo good. is a pretty good, um, Book social bookmarking site. Howard Reingold in particular has a lot of curated stuff on Digo. So yep. he goes through periodically and um, says, you know, here's literacies of cooperation, for example, or, um, uh, you know, stuff about social media. Okay, great. Thank you. I've been a Digo user for years and I'm currently migrating it off. To where? To where? The brain. Ah, okay. Yeah, after 21 years. Um, of my love-hate relationship with the brain, I finally got it figured out that it was the wrong perspective. See, so I, I think you I, said that you had uninstalled and uninstalled it like four or five times in those twenty years. No, probably more like fifteen or twenty. Wow! Uh, it's it's like it's like an addiction. Yeah. I get disturbed with it, I uninstall it, and then I turn around and it's back again. But I live in Chrome. Okay, there is nothing on my system. Everything is out on the network someplace. You're on a Chromebook. No, on, in, in the Chrome browser, yeah. but on a, on a PC. Yep. But I, I can go to anywhere else and go to work. I mean, it's just, so, but, and I liked Digo because of the way it integrated into Chrome, so that when I did a search in Chrome, it also showed me all of my Digo links that were already um, curated in one way or another. Okay. So, um, though, the problem was that I was, upset because the brain was someplace else I had to go look for stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that, that the problem was I need to live in the brain as opposed to Chrome. So that the brain is the place that I live now and everything else is from there because on lots of instances, the stuff that I'm looking for shows up in the right-hand window in the brain as opposed to having to go somewhere. Now, I, I still like Digo because it allows me to annotate web pages and PDF files. I mean, people send me things to review, and after I review the PDF and put all these comments in it, I just send them a link so that all of the highlights and comments that I thought about when I was reviewing it are in there. So I have a lot of links in my brain now that are links to PDF files in Digo. So Digo is not going to completely go away. It was just a different way of viewing the best way to operate. So I'm, uh, the brain may be here to stay this time. Awesome. Any way I can be helpful? 
LMK, as they say. Okay. And I'm just showing everybody Howard Rheingold, and I'm looking for his uh, literacies of cooperation. He's got a bunch of stuff in there. <clears throat> Here we go. Uh, cooperation studies. This is all, these are all Howard's posts. Here, this is, this is probably the best starting point. Um, so I need to grab the URL from down here, paste it into our chat. Uh, this is the literacies of cooperation, and then I'll send a link to that spot in my brain so you can follow that. Oops, that didn't copy properly. I think I went too quickly. Jerry, did the stuff get sent out from the last session? Did I miss it or did it I, go out? You know what? It may have been sent out from the last session only in my brain here because I thought I did, but I, this morning I woke up going, did I actually send that? So let me, I'll, I'll double check. I think I, I, think I did not. Um, you mean the last uh, Inside Jerry's Brain call? Yeah, I will check. Anybody hey, else? Uh, I've gotten my wish. I unfortunately have to drop off for a coach to do a coaching call. So happy holidays, everyone. Thank you and see you in Jerry's brain in the new year. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Nice Here. to see you. I do have a pursuit for the next year. Oh, go ahead, Michael. No, I'm carrying on, Gene. You got it. Um, I have adopted a uh, whole food plant-based lifestyle for the fourth time. <laughs> and, and hopefully we get it to stick this time okay i mean it's not i finally met with the uh, wellness people at the hospital i mean i understand why aa works and why um diet programs that work actually work it's because of people staying on track and employing the support system so i now have one uh, it's not a need of convincing me that it makes sense because, you know, the last 50 books and the last 250 papers are convincing enough. So uh, I'm, I'll let you know. So, I, so what's your wish list item? <clears throat> to do the right thing. <laughs> they, they asked me that at the hospital. They said, what's your objective? And I said, to do the right thing. And if I do the right thing, I'm likely to lose weight. But losing weight is not the objective. So, cool. It's, there is a, uh, you know, the adage in marketing, sell the benefits, not the features. And the best example I know of that is the title of the book about a plant-based diet, which is a book called How Not to Die. <laughs> I read that one. Ah. <clears throat> did you like it? Yes, I did, very much. Sounds like false advertising to me. And so uh, I'm, I'm currently reading the, uh, the start solution by, uh, McGregor. I'll take a look. You got me looking in my brain. I don't have how not to die, which is terrible. And I don't have the start solution. So I got some work to do. I will go back. Are, to the there, are there things that you choose not to put in your brain? Oh yeah. My brain is um, to me, the long-term repository of things worth remembering. So I, I try not to put ephemera. I mean, I was just actually, I was just thinking about this in the shower this morning. My brain is not a compendium of everything that I saw. It's not uh, my, you know, it's not life blogging. It's not everything that happened in front of me. Um, it's, and it's also not my to-do list. It's also not my calendar. It's also not the way I do outlines of essays or whatever else I'm trying to do. I don't put them in the brain. Um, I'll do an outline in an outliner or in Google Docs or somewhere else, and I'll keep a link to that outline as the basis of the document. I'll put that in my brain. So the brain is, is like this curated space for things worth remembering and things that might be useful to others. And that's my threshold. And if, if, if it isn't worth remembering, <clears throat> then probably it's just gonna clutter the brain. So why put it in, right? So there's always an editorial judgment. 
That said, when you get down to the nitty gritty of events day by day, so I'll, I'll click here on year two of the Trump administration, which uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty soon I'm gonna be going to year three of the Trump administration, but you know, uh, let's see, his perverse advantage, Donald Trump's radical honesty, the Dow falls 2000 in February. Well, right now we're in bear, you know, a bear market territory. Government shuts down. Some of these are a little too day to day. Some of these are, are very much about current events and so forth. But in many cases, I keep them because they had insights in them or they gave texture for what was happening. And to me, the texture of the moment is really interesting because one of the weird things about history is the further back you scroll in history, the less you realize that their day to day was just like our day to day. Like, you know, we look back on some large event and we only see the large event as a big clump, but it turns out that week to week in the run up, there was somebody betrayed somebody and somebody made the news because this and some other thing happened. And, you know, if you go back to Egypt, if we could only read the news feed for, for you know, what was happening in one of the dynasties in Egypt, it would read very much like our news feed now. They just didn't have the technology. But, but a lot of insight comes from the texture. Like you begin to understand why some of the players acted the way they acted when you can get under their skin a little bit through reading as close as possible to the ground in that time. Does that make sense? Uh, what's relative, what's relevant is relative. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and my brain only claims to be my own perspective on, uh, on what I see and what I care about. And it's, it's intentionally my own perspective. So uh, I like that about it a lot. Other thoughts? I'm going to go ahead and add how not to die. Um, a thought on the everyday <coughs> the, uh, texture of the moment and it sort of repeats yes it is uh, it's all it's all relative except what's surprising is if you go back the same things so i was just going to call people's attention to sinclair lewis's uh it can't happen here mm -hmm. it reads like it just reads like today it's uh it's quite amazing in its everydayness of our life now Absolutely. I think this, this all speaks to the need to find a new narrative. <laughs> you, know, the, the, you know, I'm delighted to get the nostalgia of your 30s videos and films, uh, Jerry, but that was then. And where we need to be now, this is my year, my year wish is the year of fruition, mm. bear, bearing fruit. And I'm talking about the sort of the biological um, level of creativity, that things emerge. So I'm very excited by the mushroom stuff, uh, the my mycelium. We, we need a mycelium at a social level that is a fast, short, simple, quick meme transfer. You know, if, if you've got to move memes through, um, the cycle, I do it because I see you do it, but then I get somebody else to do it because they see me do it. That uh, replication rate in its frequency and its um, effectiveness is critical. And I think if we're gonna find a cooperative context for our planetary process, it's gonna be because there's a meme of cooperation is easily and quickly disseminated and fulfilled. Mm -hmm not just a, a story, not just a, no, a video, um, um, a whole video world of, um, I wouldn't call it Game of Thrones myself, but something like that, you know, um, Lauren's proposition about media. Uh, but media that, that shows us what's going on. Um, and, I mean, basically for me, it's, it's about the circularity of society and behavior and um, containment and responsibility and localization and responsible globalization. And that's for me all about circular money, which is my gig. So the subplot would be the end of the silver bullet and the time to get the lead out. 
Which is Whenever ironic, I... ironically what's happening to bullets right now. The uh, bullet makers are being convinced to get the lead out, uh, quite literally, because it's poisoning wildlife and, and hurting them when they eat the game they've shot, et cetera. But that, that, that's like a simple sub-narrative, but go ahead. But it, it's um, accurate sort of metaphor. Like, um, I've been talking about uh, the problems with money and what could be done for about 30 years now. And I keep getting told, oh, if you think you have a solution, then you're deceived by your silver bullet. There is no simple solution. This is a wicked problem. Therefore, it requires multiple cross-reference solutions. There is no one thing that will make a big difference. Screw that bullshit. When you've got lead between your ears, when you've been shot dead with so many bullets from the conventional money system, you don't need a silver bullet. You need to just get the lead out. You need to stop your dependence upon linear money, extractive money, capitalist money, by picking up something which, as Bucky Fuller said, does the job better. So fruition of circular money as a realistic, powerful, and immediate concept at a global level. That's my wish list for the year. Thank you. Will you do a call on Jerry's brain about that? I would love to hear more about that. Delighted, delighted. So Michael, why don't you send me a one paragraph description of, with, with some precision of what, what you would like to have the call be about, and I will set that up first week in, in January or whatever? Delighted, sure. Let's do that, I love that. I'm talking about for one paragraph at a time, it's exciting. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I was just showing Michael in my brain, so uh, a bunch of the work he's done, I probably am missing a couple things. Um, I'll go back to him as soon as I finished e adding the starch solution, which I just did. Uh, One actually, question, Jerry, do you yes. have a connection to Rushkoff and myself, Douglas Rushkoff? Between, between the connection for both of you? Yeah. Um, I have both of you in my brain for sure, but I don't think I have a connection between you. Okay. Well, there we go. Uh, so, because <clears throat> in 2011, you uh, facilitated a conversation that Doug and I had. Ah, if you recall, I'll send you the link on that. Thank you. Um, what were the, what, do you remember what words it might have associated with? Because very likely it's actually in here someplace. Uh, we had a Yi Ten call on Occupy Wall Street back when that he was in. Yeah, no. Uh, I'll bring it up. I've got okay. it in my, my Thanks. Phone. Thanks. Thank it's you. Funny. It's funny because um, sometimes in my brain, like I can tell that Doug and I were both at a conference called The Future of Money in 2010. <clears throat> that was hosted by, uh, I think, the Institute for the Future. Is that the one I'm thinking about? No, this is a different event. Um, which is, I think, where I met Michelle Bowens, who's also super interesting on these topics. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I've got it here. putting it in the chat for you. Thank you. And someone has named yet another book I don't know about, The Fate of Empires, so I'm looking that up. That's, it's not a book, it's a paper. And that's a oh, link to my Diga library. Uh, got it. So I, pulled, I pulled that up because of the comment about cycles repeating. Yep. That's thousands of years of history repeating over and over and over again. But it's a short paper. It's like only 20 papers. Yeah. Yourself. One of the things that's interesting is, uh, and here's a, a way to love Google, is I just Googled The Fate of Empires and I got a different book by a different person. So here's a, uh, a book by John Hubbard, which is not what you're saying. Here's the paper you're talking about by uh, John Baggett Glub. Do I have Glub in my brain? Uh, I can easily find out. So I don't have John Baggett Glub, which is 
something I will fix. But then it turns out that there's an hour and a half talk by somebody, Red Air, on YouTube about it. And, or here's the, I don't know, I don't know if this is related. Clearly this is related to the, to the paper. Um, and so sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll add a bunch of stuff to my brain, but I'll go watch a video before or instead of reading the book, because if the video is pretty good, I can get the gist of it without putting in the 15 hours to read the book or whatever. Go ahead, James. I almost always go to YouTube first. Yeah. Looking for an interview with the author or the author doing a TED Talk or something for the same reason that you mentioned, because I can't remember the last time I actually finished a book. Because people keep saying, you got to read this book, you got to read this book, and there just are not enough hours. Yeah, they all chain together after a while. I have a whole lot of half-finished books uh, in my, actually, Kindle reader, because I only now buy physical books if there is no Kindle version. I'm afraid that I've, I've Kindled my, my library. <coughs> um, so here's John Bagot Glub, who also was known as Glub Pasha. Oh, really interesting. Seriously. The world is full of so many fascinating humans. All right, um, we are close to the end of our time for the call. Uh, more subtle than search. Let's see if I have that in my brain. Uh, it will, oh, that's fun. So this will please you, Michael, although it will not please any of us that I couldn't find it right away. But uh, that post was already in my brain. I'm linking the two. Thank you. Yep, yep. So it existed in there, but it was buried. It was basically, you know, if I, if I'm, if I was looking at you, and the brain does not let me say, I cannot run a query in my brain that says, are there any thoughts that connect Michael Linton to Doug Rushkoff? I can't do that. Mm. Yeah. At least I don't know a way to do that. So that was right here, visible to us, but it was not easy to see that Doug was there. There is a way to do second degrees in, in this view. I could turn on, show me the next links out. So a whole lot of small text shows up. I never do that. It slows everything down. It's a little too much info on the screen. But if I had had that turned on, we might have been able to squint and see Doug's name show up next to that link, right? But Anyway, so set operators don't really work here. I can't, I can't do, you know, show me where this intersects that. And never mind, show me Michael Linton's brain and my brain. In what areas do we both have a lot of similar thoughts? That kind of thing, that doesn't work. Which is a great shame as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I find really useful in the brain is right after I enter a thought, hit F4. And what does that do? It brings up a Google search. Oh, around that, around that thought. Right. Oh. And, and that particular feature is reconfigurable so you can explicitly search in specific places if you want to. Huh. Fascinating. So if, so if I yeah. specifically want to search in Amazon, or in a couple of other libraries, uh, I've reconfigured my F4, so there are multiple options. Very cool. One thing I still don't have and can't easily do is a keyboard shortcut to take whatever page I'm looking at and flip it into the brain wherever I'm looking in the brain. I, I don't have a quick keyboard shortcut. I'm still dragging manually the, the link, which is pretty silly. No. And I've, I've asked for it a bunch of times, but never seems to quite. Quite work. Are you using the new version with Brainbox? I'm yes. I, but, I'm lo I'm loving that feature. Interesting. So Brainbox is a, like an email address you can send a link to, and then when you're in the brain, you open up the Brainbox, and then you can basically harvest from there and go add things to the brain, right? Right. And they now they now have it working with the iOS app, and shortly they'll have it working with the Android app. Oh, good. That's good. Because uh, I never I almost never edit my brain on iOS. I pretty much don't touch it. Right? right, but I do a lot of wandering on my phone. Yeah. And I'd like to grab those links. All right. Currently, I'm stuffing them someplace else. I'm stuffing them in Digo, yep. and I have to bring them over from there. Yep, cool. So you can just flip them into the inbox, into the brain box from Digo, 
and then boom, boom, boom. That sounds very like a quick way. Any last words or wishes before we wrap this call, before the holidays start in earnest? Besides world my wish, Go ahead, my, wish is for, my wish is for everyone to have a great holiday and a great 2019. Thank you. A so lovely wish. Next Tuesday? <laughs> I didn't hear what he said. I said, are we meeting next Tuesday? <laughs> next Tuesday, I think, is occupied. I don't know. I, uh, but, you know, but I'll, but I'll probably put up an IJB call for next week sometime because some of us will, will enjoy getting together and having a conversation like this. So I'll, uh, if, you can, if you have a topic that's burning, that sounds like a good topic for an Inside Jerry's Brain call, send me an email and I might actually use that for next week or I'll, or I'll think of something else. Lauren, thank you for joining us. Really, really appreciate your being here. Yeah, me too. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Happy Thanks, holidays. Jerry. Bye, Happy everyone. holidays. Take care. Happy solstice. All right. Happy yeah. holidays. Happy solstice, especially. Yeah. <laughs>